After the death of Solomon, we see an almost immediate decline in the kingdom. Solomon's son takes over and almost immediately demonstrates a very poor lack of judgment and generally shows that he doesn't have the wisdom that his father had, that this knowledge hadn't been transferred to the next generation. And there's a lot of themes of inheritance and things of that nature in the Bible, and we see that the wisdom of Solomon was not given as an inheritance, that his capacity for good decisions and good governance was lost with him. And so this is much of the rest of the Book of Kings and a fair bit of Chronicles is just detailing all the different misadventures these kings have in these failing empires. And these are all interesting oral histories of these sort of ancient monarchies in the Levant. But the person that we want to follow during this time is this very significant prophet, that of Elijah, who's here to try and stop the whole thing falling apart. And Elijah has these very close parallels to the prophet Samuel, who very intensely represented the will of God in the face of a king, in the face of a people who didn't want to hear it. Now, much of the story of Elijah sets him in conflict with the king at the time, Ahab, and his wife, Jezebel, who have become somewhat famous archetypes, even if they're not particularly well known as to what actually happened with them. Ahab is a weaker king, very much controlled by his wife, and his wife is, in turn, in cohorts with Baal and the priests of Baal. And these priests of Baal have been hunting the prophets. And so Elijah is one of these prophets who have been in hiding from the servants of Baal. And so despite this great risk to his life that Jezebel and the cult of Baal are attempting to kill him, he still goes to meet with Ahab. And so we're here in Kings chapter 18, where Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And so this is a significant line for the prophets, is that in these darker times, the prophets are seen as these people who are troubling Israel. They're, they're troubling the conscience. They're troubling the affairs. They're making things worse from the perspective of the kings and the people. And this is what you expect to see even today is... When things are particularly dark, those who want to return things to the light are seen as these troublesome individuals. They're disruptive, they're unproductive. And so Elijah fits very much into this category. But Elijah answers, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves, four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are four hundred and fifty men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So what we have here is another sort of magical duel occurring, somewhat like we saw with Moses and the magicians of the Pharaoh, where we have one prophet in conflict against many, and there's this demonstration of power that Elijah will call upon the absolute God to bring down fire, and these 450 priests of Baal will attempt to have Baal send down his fire. 
And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called in the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And this is one of these sort of strange phenomena that we see both in the mystical parts of the Bible and in the early histories as well, talking about the church fathers or various conflicts with pagans, is you see this phenomenon where there's this expectation that Baal really will come down and bring fire and in the sense that he also has in the past that this is almost the default expectation but instead now that the prophets have arrived that these powers no longer are present that even while this cult of Baal still lives the, the power of Baal has begun to dwindle and so this goes on and it says that the priests of Baal cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out of them. And so this is further instance of this blood sacrifice that they're offering now, not just their voice, but their blood to Baal in the hopes that this can finally awaken him. And so this is somewhat of a more extreme measure that they're beginning to offer these more elaborate sacrifices to this being who really should answer them at this point is the expectation it's worth emphasizing right these people are not or at least not being portrayed here as dumb and delusional and they're the people that are operating under a set of rules that they've lived by that ball operates in this fashion and he responds to these sacrifices and so it's notable that this is no longer functioning right? these rules no longer apply and so that's a very large difference from them just being stupid or something. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. They did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. They did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And so, as we saw with Moses, there's this extra layer. There's where the priests of Baal could have burned this dry offering that Elijah is demonstrating that the absolute God can burn it drenched with water. And so the offering is burned. And then Elijah orders the people to gather up the priests of Baal. And Elijah brings them down to the brook Kishon and kills them there. And now Ahab's not a very opinionated man, so he has no particular objection to all this. And then Elijah ends a drought that's been plaguing his kingdom, so he kind of makes it work. But when he goes and tells his wife Jezebel all that Elijah has done, then Jezebel is even more determined to kill Elijah. And so this sort of goes on, really, is that you have Ahab as this very fair-weather person, almost. He facilitates between being inspired by Elijah and returning to God and having good things happen because of this, and when his wife has more influence, then he returns to this worship of Baal and the problems that occur because of this. But eventually Ahab dies and one of his sons takes over and so he has these different heirs who are more or less inclined to ball worship. And so after some ongoing back and forth, eventually Elijah is 
brought up by this chariot of fire and horses of fire up into a whirlwind into heaven. And so everything then is left to Elisha and the other sons of the prophets who are just this sort of group of individual prophets who are trying to restore the land to God. But ultimately this line of kings becomes more and more corrupted. And so finally towards the end of kings we see the arrival of this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who comes to finally destroy the kingdom. And so after some initial conflicts, Jerusalem is finally destroyed. The people of Jerusalem carried off into Babylonian captivity, and the temple of Solomon is destroyed. And so the destruction of this temple, which is considered to be the literal dwelling place of God, is very religiously significant. It almost prevents this traditional animal sacrifice and it prevents the practice of the religion as they knew it. And so this begins the period of Babylonian captivity. And so there's a couple influential prophets who've come out of this, Daniel and Ezekiel, both of whom are worth dwelling on in quite a bit more depth.